Yeah, thank you, Laura, for this uh, great introduction. And I think it's very good to set the scene and establish some common understanding. Uh, my name is Cornelius. I'm uh, from IO, as Caro introduced. And uh, maybe I can start by uh, telling you how I prepared for this session today. So uh, we had this speaker training last week, and I had this coach who gave me tips and tricks on how to moderate a panel, etc. And he asked me, when is your panel? And I said, uh, it's on the second day. And then he said, oh. That's bad, that's the hangover day. <laughs> <laughs> then he asked the exact timing, and then I said, yeah, you know, it's from 11 to 12, right before lunch break, and then he said, oh, that's even worse. <laughs> and then finally he asked me, what is the panel about? And I said, you know, it's this legal panel about new EU regulation, how it affects <laughs> online advertisement. <laughs> And then the, the speaker coach didn't say anything at all um, <laughs> anymore. So um, having that in mind, we want to, um, even though we might be in a tough spot uh, time-wise and maybe also content-wise, we want to keep this very um, open and flexible. Um, we have a little Q&A kind of when we are halfway through with what we want to discuss. So I just invite all of you to yeah, uh, be interactive. If you have questions, uh, you get to ask them. We also have a Q&A planned at the end of the session. And uh, with that, I think we can dive into our, um, our discussion. Um, you know uh, who we are and where we're from. Uh, you know now also a little bit about uh, the key challenges uh, that um, ad tech is facing based on these new uh, laws. And this brings me to my first uh, quick question, if we could do a quick round with the speakers. And I'm just wondering, do you think that now that we will have the DSA and the DMA changing regulations for online ad tech. Do we have a better place in Europe now compared to before? Thank you, Cornelius. We're going to try to be fun, I guess, uh, <laughs> in that particular uh, slot. Um, yeah, definitely. You know, these are, I think it's fair to say that these are maybe once in a generation um, regulations that are, you know, um, um, they're going to have a big impact for sure. But the question for us really is, how this is going to be enforced. And uh, maybe later I can come back to this issue of DAC patterns that actually is already regulated, but you know, uh, hasn't been very much uh, followed by actual actions. So I think this is going to be the, the real focus in the, in the coming years. Uptoff, maybe first? Sure. Um, I mean, we definitely, at least at Mozilla, have worked a fair bit on many of the provisions that Laura just spoke about, as well at transparency, dark patterns, uh, consent for sharing data services. And we think that while many of these are already present in other regulations, some in data protection, some in consumer protection, um, the fact that it, these regula the, both these acts were very much crafted, keeping the largest players in mind. And as a participant in the internet economy, but not one of the large players, we think that they hold great potential to open things up. But completely agree with uh, Olian where it's definitely going to, it's a question of enforcement. And enforcement not just in the what do regulators end up doing, but how well do they understand the issue? Um, how well do they understand ways in which you can very much follow the letter of the law, but not necessarily its spirit? Um, and then we've seen, I think, a lot of that with the GDPR over the last five years as well. So I think it's an opportunity to see uh, whether the ecosystem has learned the lessons from coming up with great laws, but maybe not necessarily going after enforcement the way they should. And uh, it's something that we're very much looking forward to engaging in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just sort of to, to add to that, I think companies are looking at enforcement as well, but maybe also you know, with a bit of a worry because these laws are not the best drafted laws, um, which is super exciting as a lawyer, by the way. I don't understand at all why your coach reacted like that. <laughs> but um, companies are very concerned about what this means in practice and investing heavily into making design choices now. Um, to make sure that they comply with both DMA and DSA with a lot of uncertainty because these laws don't spell out what you have to do and also what you have to do when you've got a, uh, overlap with other legislation like the GDPR. And so with this enforcement in mind, um, it's, it's quite worrisome for companies. Okay, so I get the sense generally good moves, enforcement, and what it actually means remains to be seen, and we cover that also in a little bit. What do you think is maybe missing from the new laws? Is there something that, yeah, that the, the lawmaker did not think about, or something that was thrown out through the legislative process, which which you would have liked to see? 
Yeah, I mean, you know, during the, the process, we brought our support a few times around stricter rules around behavioral advertising, at least mm -hmm. the, the collection of data that enables that. So the DSA fell short on that. But, you know, on the other hand, we, we also see that the final deal uh, does contain a number of, you know, important elements. So we mentioned DAC patterns. And generally, the idea that users, both through the DSA and the DMA, should be put much more in effective control of what they want to share and, and how. And um, you know what matters then is, is to turn this into uh, designs and products that actually uh, work for, for users into really deciding what they want to do with the data. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I think that one would definitely be uh, how the definition of what core platform services uh, within the law, uh, especially in the DMAs, has expanded a fair bit. That's something that we, uh, in our work, were advocating for a fair bit of like sort of judicious interpretation because anything that's a core platform service, while the law really makes it look like it only applies to the gatekeepers, uh, there may be lots of other core platform services, for example, a browser, which is a core platform service, uh, that is caught up in the implications of a lot of these laws. And I think like Laura's presentation definitely talks about why, while these obligations may just apply to gatekeepers, that doesn't mean that anybody who's not a gatekeeper can go about doing whatever they want to right now, right? Like there are contractual changes, there may even have to be some business model changes. And we think that um, those were a little bit of an afterthought uh, in, in a lot of the rhetoric in the conversation of the law. And it's, it's something that I think when the subsidiary regulations get created under the DMA and the DSA, it's something that uh, both people should advocate for and should be kept in mind to make sure that uh, one of the experiences, for example, with the GDPR was that, uh, and it's an argument that I don't think is completely without merit, is that it ended up creating a regulatory moat around the largest players, which allowed them to comply with the law or seem to comply with the law's harshest provisions, but also ensured that unless you were someone who could invest billions of dollars into trust and safety compliance and data protection compliance, you would never be able to cross that moat again, and therefore they were the only ones who could provide certain services at that scale. And I think that this is a little bit of an opportunity to try to balance that out, um, both in terms of, of course, enforcement, and we will talk about it, but also in terms of the regulations that you design under these laws as well that account for what happens to gatekeeper platforms and what happens to platforms impacted by these regulations but are not gatekeeper platforms. Okay. Now that, you, that, that I think all of you mentioned in enforcement, maybe we can dig a bit deeper. And um, I also, from, from my daily work, I also see the struggles with enforcing of uh, enforcement of GDPR, even though the GDPR is now here for quite a while, and then you have a lot of different authorities, and there are, there's one national one in each EU country. For us in Germany, you have like then one for each um, each state, so it's super fragmented. Uh, everything takes forever, and um, yeah, I think a lot of people argue, and I have some sympathy for that argument that the enforcement part of GDPR falls short. How? Maybe a twofold questions. A, how is this foreseen, especially with the DMA? Will there be like a new, new authority, new thing where a lot of people work and, and go after the big companies? Um, so how is this foreseen? And also, what are your, your um, yeah, wishes or, or, or hopes how this enforcement should look like that we end up having not only new rules, but actually having them implemented? So um, just on what it, look like, what it would look like in practice, I think they're going to be, if I understand this correctly, right, they're going to be adding more uh, people and resources to the commission, I think to existing units in the commission. They're not creating a new body uh, for enforcement. Mm. And I totally agree with you. Like we've seen with the GDPR that that's this fragmented enforcement, which is at the national level, is not helpful. Maybe it's helpful actually for big companies who um, most of them have their HQ in Ireland and know that the Irish um, Data Protection Authority is just a bottleneck for GDPR enforcement. Um, and that's been heavily criticized under the GDPR. Um, issue is, I, I mentioned other laws that are being in, made in the EU as well. Same thing, like AI Act will have national enforcement as well. And so I spoke with someone at the European Parliament about this exact issue and said, well, actually a lot of people in the institutions would want some centralized enforcement for all these digital laws, but it's just not foreseen. It's not foreseen in the budget. 
that they have for years to come, and it would probably require a lot of like, political will to bring enforcement power at the EU level and taking it away from the national level. So even though I think it would make a lot of sense, I don't know if it would happen in anytime soon. Okay. Yeah, um, you know, like, it's, I think, countries were very sensitive with the GDPR experience and really wanted to avoid uh, falling in the same situation. But they also did not want to put in money to create a new agency. So they did the default choice of saying, well, the European Commission can do it. <laughs> and so we're going to have these uh, new regulations. And, and the European Commission, which finds itself suddenly with uh, having a whole new enforcement power, uh, which wasn't the case before or in a, in a, in a, in a much more limited way. Um, so clearly, you know, we are part of companies that are really asking very clearly for more resources uh, for the Commission. You know, if you put that level of uh, responsibility to the Commission, they need to have the resources that go with it. Um, but, you know, the, the good news is that they do have a very important experience in dealing with large companies in the tech sector especially when it comes to uh, antitrust. And so uh, a number of people that are currently dealing with antitrust cases, they are going to be the ones dealing with the DMA side of things um, in large parts. And um, you know, it's, it's good that uh, they can draw from that experience and maybe move to some place that is a bit less like kind of um, uh, you know, looking at specific cases and sanctioning behavior after it happened to instead try and build some more like co-regulatory approach where um, uh, you know, we can get to a place where companies uh, adjust their behavior um, before any sanction comes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think that uh, we'll disappoint your vocal coach if we don't end up cracking, you know, using some like lawyery Latin terms. <laughs> uh, but I mean, the DMA is a legislation and the DSA in a way are both ex ante regulations. And what that means in practice is that they're regulations that don't just get enforced when you do something wrong, right? Like if there is a law that says this is what you should do as a law, um, and if you breach that law, then there is remedial actions uh, taken, which means that if you're not supposed to pick up a water bottle, and you pick up the water bottle, the government can come and tell you you shouldn't have picked up that water bottle. Um, but these laws are actually more about both more subjective enforcement, but also in preventing certain kinds of harms from occurring in the first place, right? And I think only sort of hinted towards that direction by saying a co-regulatory, like the intention is not say this is what you are supposed to do and not supposed to do. There are provisions like that in the law, but also this is the kind of behavior we want to encourage and this is the kind of behavior we want to discourage. And that distinction is a pretty important one, right? Because of the rate of evolution of technology, it's very hard to come up with how many ever hundred or thousand words that you want that encodes a certain set of behaviors. and. 10 years later, you might have technology that makes a lot of it very relevant. And I think we are starting to see that even with some parts of uh, the GDPR as well. And I think that that distinction, that flexibility that the law quite deliberately, I think, provides is both the opportunity and uh, the like something that to be a little wary of. Because uh, the opportunity, of course, is that that means uh, the regulator that is being set up in the commission is not just going to be, here is a letter, we are filing a case against you, right? It'll be a, we are coming up with a code of conduct. The code of conduct says that in this field, this is how you're broadly supposed to behave. And on that behavior, if you don't follow it, then we will launch an investigation. But if you think you're following that code of conduct broadly, then things will be better for consumers. That flexibility of, uh, it's something that actually in many other sectors, I think is a lot more mature because they've been around for much longer. If you look at the automobile sector, if you look at like, um, I think the uh, the uh, like the airlines industry in the aviation sector, uh, the amount of back and forth between industry participants and regulators is much more than it has been traditionally in the tech sector. But the tech sector, in a way, in these regulations is like 15 years old, um, probably even lesser. So because of that, I think that's also the from an enforcement perspective an interesting angle, which is not just saying what is allowed and not allowed, but encouraging certain kinds of behavior. Yeah, and I would maybe add the the hypothesis at least that then. You could also believe that the laws are more future-proof when you don't yeah, um, define exactly everything in great detail, but if you follow this co-regulatory principle-based approach, similar like GDPR in some cases, then you have also covered future technologies that you are maybe not aware of that it might be a problem already. Um, 
This brings me to, to another question, and it's, it's something that, uh, Laura, you also explained in, in, your, um, in your introduction. So one of the provisions of the Digital Services Act covers this targeted ad span on um, either sensitive personal data, so political uh, beliefs, for example, or um, medical information, etc. Um, and we learned yesterday a little bit how hard it is to say what is political and what not, but maybe we, uh, we parked that for a second. And the, um, the second provision is that there should be no more targeted ads facing um, children and minors. Um, but I recall from, from the debate, uh, the parliament and some parties in the parliament, they tried to push a complete ban on targeted advertisement. So it was debated uh, for quite a while if the law should say no more ads targeting people based on any kind of personal information. And obviously, this was a huge debate in, in our industry. And I remember um, on yeah, both sides of the arguments, very, very vocal debates. Um, we learn now that we ended up with kind of a, a middle ground compromise. But still, I think the, the question is very interesting to think about how personalization for ads should work online because of course you have the privacy and the user interests and rights on the one hand, and then you have also the arguments, of course, from the publishers and the advertisers who say, you know, we need some form of personalization to monetize our content and to keep content free. So even though the legislative debate is now on that ban over, at least for now, um, maybe Aurelia, if you can share what your take was on this um, on this proposal, and then also what your what your general thoughts are on this um, yeah this balancing act of the two interests. Sure, uh, I mean, uh, for when that targeted ban conversation was taking place, uh, we as Mozilla like didn't. Uh, we were actually one of the, I think, a lot of people expected us to sign on to the th the thing that said, like, ban all targeted advertising. And the primary reason that we did not is because we did a fair bit of, like, work internally to determine, imagine this were to pass. And by, say, early 2024, you were not able to add, add like, target you know, people on the basis of personal data, like, what would its impact on the internet be? And what is the outcome that the people who are pushing for the ban want? Um, and we think, and we thought that they, they were too, like, quite far apart, right? The, uh, at least we think that uh, eventually there is a world and an outcome where the privacy harms that arise from targeted advertising, like, I think, significantly override the benefits that come from targeted advertising. But we don't think that the ecosystem is ready for to do or to serve advertising without targeted advertising, right? So it's it, it, like we think it'll be like taking a hammer to what is a very delicate problem. Um, and internally, at least, the way that we've been approaching it is what at Mozilla we broadly call privacy-preserving advertising, which are ways in which targeting can take place, um, but without the privacy harms that occur. And for us, the privacy harms actually begin with collection itself. So Ben, who just gave the presentation before this, when he was talking about IPA, um, a lot of folks have been pretty surprised that like Mozilla is really working with Meta on, on something to do with advertising. Isn't like how do your two brands like reconcile that? And our response to that has been very clear, which is that we think that it is the most uh, tangible and thought through way that we've come across in all of the, and we've been part of these groups for many years, that actually attempts to do something like attribution without collecting people's data and without leading to outcomes uh, that, like I think Ben mentioned, even if a, 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 a service provider is compromised, will protect uh, user information as well. And the way that we see it, it's a gradual process that it's clear that in the short term, there needs to be a lot more research, things like does contextual advertising work? Are there ways in which it can be improved and be made better? Uh, the, in the sort of uh, like medium term, what are the technical solutions that allow for similar outcomes without the harms that we're associated with? And in the long term, uh, like that's where we think the question of like what kinds of behavioral advertising is okay and what kind of behavioral advertising should actively be prohibited is a conversation that, that we should have. But we think it's like at a minimum a five to ten year like conversation, not one that like I, there are definitely merits and benefits to pushing for. Uh, you know, like banning targets, because that moves the conversation forward, and it's a movement, so there are in the whole spectrum of people in that movement, but uh, like that's yeah, our, some our thinking in a nutshell. What was your position on the proposed ban? Um, yeah, you know, um, uh, you know, the approach we have on this is that uh, 
in our case, we've been profitable since 2014 on the basis of uh, contextual advertising. And so, you know, we tend to, to think that uh, should more investments go into that type of advertising, it's something that would also become, you know, much more popular for, for the whole ecosystem. So that's why we tend to have this sort of, uh, of position on, uh, on behavioral ads. But, you know, another very important um, point for us is that users are able to make a choice for their own privacy. Um, so that's the philosophy behind our product, right? We are trying to be not just the search engine that doesn't track you, but also the simple button for um, privacy wherever you browse and whatever um, app or device you use. So that's what our extension does on, on browser. It blocks the, the different third-party trackers. That's what our uh, app tracking protection does on, uh, on Android uh, that we're going to release it from, from beta uh, um, uh, at some point. Uh, that also blocks trackers uh, within your, your phone coming from the different apps. And it's really important that um, these features are able to, you know, to work properly. And uh, that's also where, once more, a regulation like the DMA can, can be useful in ensuring that uh, apps like ours uh, have access to the right uh, features mm. uh, and, and functionalities on a device, on a browser, to make these uh, features work properly. Um, usually those, um, those discussions about, um, yeah, banning targeted ads, for example, bring in, uh, yeah, very much, uh, thoughts and reactions. So we want to open up uh, now our halftime Q and A in just a, just a second. So you can get ready before that. I want to ask one more question, maybe Laura to you, because you also briefly mentioned this, um, the way the targeted ad spend now ended up being in the law is, among other things, those um, protections of, of minors um, um, when it comes to this. And I'm very curious how this will work in practice, um, because obviously most publishers don't know how old their, their users are. And uh, then I think, you know, when you go on a website of, of a, a beer manufacturer or something, they have, are you 18? And then you can click yes, and nobody checks. Um, then I think if you need age verification, then you end up in processing more personal data in the end. So just curious if there's already some, some guidance or some ideas on how to actually make that work. Guidance, no. Ideas, yes. And I'm curious, just as you are, um, and so are many companies. It's not clear. Um, so the DSA provides that um, you can't target users um, with uh, targeted advertising if you have reasonable certainty that the users are minors. But you don't have to collect more information about their age than you already have. At the same time, under the GDPR, there's more and more companies implementing age verification mechanisms on their websites because of regulatory guidance, in particular in the UK and Ireland, that recommends that you verify the age of your users so that you can adapt the design of your um, services to the age of your users. You can ensure that your privacy notice, for instance, is understandable if you have users who are minors. Um, that's kind of guidance. And so we see that for those reasons, there's more and more age verification. But if you do that and you want to comply with that, it means you are going to have more knowledge about the user's age, which means you're making it more difficult for yourself under the DSA and bringing you in, into the scope of that um, targeted ad ban for minors. So how is that going to play out in practice? What we see in practice now, unfortunately, is a lot of companies who we see from their counterparties in contract negotiations very strict um, contractual provisions, don't send me any data that includes kids, don't send me any data relating to minors. And that might actually be very difficult if you don't know or you're not, you don't have that certainty. Um, so how are you going to comply with that? And then the question is, you know, what's your negotiation power? So that's actually sort of an unfortunate result that we see from this DSA provision right now, that co some companies just have that negotiation power and they say, well, we don't want to deal with this. You don't send me any data that might bring us in scope even if you have no clue uh, what data you're sending us. So, um, and same you know, questions you can ask about the practical implications of that other ban, using sensitive data for targeted advertising. Um, so that, as well, it seems um, like a good provision. 
I, I'm not sure if any of us would want targeted advertising using um, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, like the sensitive information. Why would you want to receive um, targeted advertising using that information? But again, under GDPR, um, and, and the DSA refers to the GDPR to give meaning to that concept of sensitive data. But under the GDPR, there was actually a quite big development um, this year at the highest court of the EU, which um, issued a judgment uh, in which it stated that when you publish someone's name together with the name of their spouse, that's sensitive information because you can infer that person's sexual orientation from that data set. And that's actually a big, big thing in the privacy community because it means that if a data set in itself doesn't seem sensitive information, but you can infer sensitive information from it, it should be treated as sensitive data under the GDPR and it becomes in scope of that concept of sensitive data under the GDPR. And that's the, the concept that is used in the DSA. It's copied into the DSA. So potentially, that ban is actually much broader in scope than we initially thought and, and legislators initially thought when they drafted this. So again, practical things to worry about and be curious about. Okay, thank you. But at least uh, your job will stay very challenging and excited, I guess, when you work with a lot of uh, negotiations like this. But um, having said this, and also looking at the time, maybe we see if we throw around the blue cube and bit then see if we have already some questions coming in. There's a... Oh, yeah. Should I actually just throw it? Yeah, yeah, you can throw it. Okay. Okay. Ah. Hi, everyone. Okay. Can I ask the first question? <laughs> so I think yesterday we learned that like what is a political ad is very open-ended, right? because it can be anything with Joe Biden's face, or it can be, or it could be a blank, like a neutral United Nations advertisement that might just be political because the UN is featured. And I wanted to bring in this thought with like the provision on minors in the DSA and ask Laura, actually, like in your opinion, what is reasonable certainty? And is there maybe like some sort of workaround? Because isn't there many ways to infer a minor Right? Like the amount of time they spend on TikTok or their certain preferences. And I was wondering if that could be maybe an opportunity for certain platforms to not have to process certain sensitive information but identify minors, or if that could also be a loophole for companies. And I wanted to kind of get your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think there, um, if you look at guidance under the GDPR, there are different ways of, of verifying the age of your users. And for instance, uh, regulators are more and more saying it's not sufficient to just have a tick box. I'm over 13 or I'm over 16. A kid knows that they have to select a different tick box. So actually what regulators are looking at is um, AI, like using AI tools to assess the behavior of these users. How do they behave? Do they behave like kids? Um, and that gives you an indication of their age. So there's, yeah, there's definitely like new things being developed to help with that. Um, I don't know if that's then a good thing or a bad thing because, as I said, you know, the more knowledge you have about the age of your users, the less argumentation you can make that you're not subject to that ban. So, and it's many different things to think about. Yeah, the, I mean, the only thing that I'd add to that, and I think it uh, is an example that's happened in a different field, like not, it didn't happen much in Europe, but it's something that was enforced in the United States, where over the last uh, three years, both Twitter and Facebook um, were discovered to have targeted ads on users on the basis of their phone numbers that users had shared for two-factor authentication for security, right? So um, when you were signing, creating your account, if you wanted to receive an OTP before logging in for security, they asked you to enter your phone number, and a lot of users said yes. Uh, but it turned out that they used that as a unique identifier when they showed ads to you, both on their platforms, but also uh, on other platforms without disclosing it at that point, right? Uh, both of them were fined a couple of hundred million dollars. Both of them had to like disclose um, the fact that they were doing this. But I think that like that's a good, pretty good example of like in like intent, where even if you're collecting data for one piece, I don't necessarily think that there was like you know a big 
like big board in a dark room that said, yes, we will use phone numbers to target ads on people. It was much more of a, what is the information that we have on people, this, what are the best unique identifiers, this, and then that started happening. And then the security teams and the privacy teams and like the ad team spoke and they said, and like they probably went, we shouldn't maybe be doing this, but look at it, it's such a great identifier, right? Um, that's I think the kind of risk that we run in these scenarios and situations as well, where once you're gathering information and data, like companies are actually not that great at knowing all the information they have and what they should use and what they should not use. The largest companies and like companies from our experience at least below that sometimes are even less uh, from a capabilities perspective capable of knowing what they should and should not do with certain kinds uh, of information. And the GDPR is helping change that, but that still means things like this can happen, even if it's without uh, intent which, uh, as well. And I think like all of the age verification questions just lead to like more outcomes like that, that if you have an AI that is analyzing people's behaviors well enough to determine whether they're under an age or above an age or not, are you really going to use that AI just to like show what kind of checkbox you should show, or would you also use that to do other things about that user, like deciding which video they should see next, or uh, what features should be tested on them, right? And it's very hard to tell a company, use it only for this, but not for that, and to enforce it. Point. I think there was one more question, yeah. Wait, so one of the things of DMA is consent, gathering consent from users, and once I saw this on the slide, I thought immediately about the cookie walls that that people just universally hate, and they've learned to click the big green button that says I accept all cookies. And I wonder if this is going to be more of the same, and if yes, would that fall under the under DSA's dark patterns, having this huge button? Yeah, so on the cookies, there's already um, enforcement of that, and we do see market practices change where um, you have to make sure that that consent is really like informed and free and so on, and what that means in practice now, if you look at regulatory guidance and, and case law, is that your button should not be enormous, oh, accept all button, and then somewhere hidden somewhere, no, reject all. And that is changing, um, and that's being enforced already under GDPR. Um, and I think, yeah, in the DSA, you do have um, like various uh, provisions around user-friendly design. You've got that provision on the dark patterns, um, which probably could cover that type of, of design as well. So um, I think the intention is to move away from that type of sort of deceptive design. At the same time, we've got all these new requirements for consent. and. We know companies are looking at how they should design those new consent flows in a way that meets all the new requirements, DMA plus still the old requirements from the GDPR, um, and how to make that work. And it's not necessarily like, oh, we're going to be deceiving people, but how we just make that work. It's not that straightforward. Yes. One more. Uh, so yeah. Um, at the beginning, you were talking about uh, data protection principles like uh, user consent, data portability, etc. cetera. Um, but how does the DMA supplement the GDPR? Because those things already exist under the GDPR. So um, my question being, um, why is that? And isn't this the bad thing? Because we get more bureaucracy, more rules, more regulations. It makes everything difficult for everybody involved. So yeah. Yeah. I, I, yes, agreed. Um, DMA is for gatekeepers, so it's a small, smaller scope than the GDPR. It complements the GDPR. It refers to the GDPR. It uses concepts of the GDPR, but maybe in a way that wasn't thought through. I just mentioned the sensitive data, which is being further and further developed under GDPR case law, and it was taken into the, the um, well, that's a DSA, but it's taken into these new laws. Uh, in a way that might actually not make that much sense if you think it through, but it doesn't seem very thought through. Uh, data portability right is in addition to the data portability right of the GDPR, but what does that mean in practice when you are a gatekeeper and you have those two obligations? Uh, knowing that under GDPR it's much more limited with exceptions, can you invoke those in exceptions when you are also a gatekeeper and you're subject to the DMA? How does that work in practice? It's not clear. and. Companies are investing a lot of resources into trying to figure it out right now. Like that's happening. Consent, same thing. If you look at the GDPR, 
consent has to be per data processing purpose. If you look at the new consent obligations of the DMA, you need consent to combine data, to cross-use data, to share data. Are these purposes? Are these activities? Like that seems like a lawyer's spiel, but in reality, these concepts are going to be enforced, and if you get it wrong, it can lead to millions of euros of fines. So it's really important, and there's a lot of people looking into this right now to make sure that they design these new flows in the right way uh, with not enough guidance, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, the only thing that, if I could like just add to that is I think that many of the practices that you see under the DMA as things that you require consent for, they've been almost, I would say, upgraded to the threshold that you require consent for, because the GDPR also has something called legitimate interest, which means that in order to like provide a certain service, you have to do certain things. But uh, in our conversations with regulators, the thinking behind that was they wanted to give users the ability to opt out of a certain subset of those practices, where, for example, uh, you can on Facebook go and say, I don't want personalized advertising, for example, but you can't say, uh, I don't want my data that you collect from other third-party websites to be used against me within Facebook, right? And whether it fits within the definition of personalized advertising or not is something that the law so far doesn't require Facebook to necessarily be able to answer. So the thinking was to take some of these practices that are a part of processing and a part of the things that large technology companies do and up-level them to the point that like, if users choose to, then they can tweak and experiment with them rather than it just being something that you know is like paragraph number 23.6.1 in a three page or uh, 300 page like terms and service to something that you can go into settings and actually move um, and you can actually already start seeing the consequences of this with some of the larger technology platforms and how they are changing their internal uh, you know like setting dashboards uh, as well like some of that they've actually done to preempt uh, the DMA and it's something that we can imagine like if you look at I think and not, and not to like compare companies or something like that, but if you look at the practices between Apple, Microsoft, Google, and Facebook, you'll actually see the amount of regulatory scrutiny that they've gotten versus how much, uh, how granular their settings pages are on a lot of these practices as well. And it's clear that they want to make sure that there is a minimum baseline across companies of a certain size. So it's definitely an evolving field, but I think their intention was not to make it like harder for these people to do business, but for users to be understand that this is how business is being done better. This is a very good, the question is a very good segue for me to ask my next question that I had on, on my list. Um, when it comes to those new um, consent requirements in the DMA, it also shows that we are at an interesting crossroads of privacy laws and privacy requirements and competition law, because this is originally where the DMA stems from. So we have now this, this new, or maybe it's not new, but it is very interesting overlap between data protection and competition rights and um, antitrust. And Aurelia, I know you, you worked on that uh, more, so can you share your take on, on this um, intersection and also if you believe that what we have now in the DMA will then balance the needs of smaller players via the big, big platforms? Yeah, thank you. So you know the, the obligation that was mentioned before around getting consent to combine data? something that stems from uh, a case in Germany against, against Facebook where it was showed that Facebook um, improved or let's say or abused its competitive position um, by illegally uh, combining data uh, across its verticals without getting proper user consent. So it was uh, infringing GDPR uh, in a way that was also infringing competition rules. And so it's, it's really excellent that the DMA is making that bridge between privacy infringements that can lead to uh, competition infringement to try and solve both at the same time. Um, and what we you know, also are looking forward with the DMA is the other way around where um, com like, uh, fair competition through a number of market rules can lead to uh, stronger privacy. And in our space, uh, an example, of course, is with the search engine, uh, where you know, we, we think that um, providing, um, let's say, fair visibility and accessibility uh, to privacy prote protective services is definitely a way um, to uh, you know, um, spread privacy, to make it more accessible. 
and an obligation in a DMA that is, I think, quite, um, quite practical, quite straightforward is going to be a broader uh, choice screen obligation and also obligations to more easily uh, switch between your uh, search engine default, browser default, um, and the fact that consumers are going be, to be, gonna be able to more easily choose and set uh, their the default for search engine and browser um, and be able to more easily choose privacy respective alternatives is gonna be a big deal for, for privacy uh, in, the, in the ecosystem. Okay, that sounds quite, quite promising and also when we reflect back what, what you said earlier about user rights and this also gets back to what Rotem said in his keynote in the very beginning, I think this is a good path forward I would, would assume at least from the very user centric perspective. Um, Okay, maybe also um, with interest of time, we can leave a little bit the, the legis legislative arena and um, cover a few more topics um, that relate to discussions we had, but that are not strictly speaking lawmaking. Um, and one example of this is that there are a lot of um, initiatives, some of them were already mentioned uh, earlier today or yesterday, where it comes to changes in the online ad tech system compared to um, what we have right now. Uh, we mentioned the W3C, for example. Jeff, I know that you are very um, yeah, in, in, the, in the weeds on all the details when it also comes to new industry initiatives, et cetera. So could you share a little bit uh, your take on, on the most important things to watch out for now that we covered the new laws as well? Sure. Uh, I mean, it, like, it's. I don't think it would be an exaggeration to say that. I think, like, if there is a regulatory development for the people in this room and a lot of the people watching otherwise online, that I think is going to be the most consequential for the ad tech ecosystem. It's actually, I believe, taking place in the UK, where the Competition and Markets Authority has uh, entered into a set of voluntary commitments with Google on the Google Privacy Sandbox. And uh, what the Google Privacy Sandbox, just as an introduction, is a set of initiatives where when Google wants to deprecate third-party cookies um, of, of technical ways in which they want to do the same, achieve the same outcomes that third-party cookies do, but without um, third-party cookies, like their APIs and other more privacy-preserving ways of, of doing so. It's definitely a multi-year project, but uh, it's, I think, a very good sign uh, and template of how the ad tech ecosystem is evolving. And the reason I would say that it's the most consequential uh, is uh, what the CMA is doing with Google is actually, I think, an example of what a regulator under the DMA will also do two and a half to three years from now, right? Which is when a new technological sort of path is being charted, engaging well before, when the path is being charted, not when a product has come into the market and people are clicking yes or no and then there is harm and then it takes five years for a case to happen, but when the technical specifications are being designed, entering into uh, commitments with the people designing those specifications saying these are the things that you need to do, these are the things that you don't need to do. And uh, in this case, Google has entered into a voluntary commitment to follow certain specifications on the design and development of certain programs. I don't think that any regulator uh, in the tech sector has done something similar at that earlier stage. Um, and uh, the outcomes of that, I think, are, are pretty interesting, right? Like, uh, in the, if you speak to people in the industry, they will tell you it's insufficient because the CMA is not looking into issues deep enough. Uh, if you speak to some other people, they will tell you that they've just heard the advertisers and they don't want Google to come to remove third-party cookies at all, so this is just a delaying tactic. So just like all, I think, interesting issues, it has people on all the sides that have different opinions. Uh, but at its core, I would say that this idea that companies can cooperate with regulators, enter into voluntary commitments, and create a formal framework for developing new tech, like standards, new processes, uh, and new services before they actually get deployed to users, and people can engage on them is, I think, a sign of the times, and, and it's only going to happen more and more uh, in the future. Uh, with specific regard to the privacy sandbox, we actually think that there is a lot that needs to be done there to be better. Like, uh, the Pat CG working group that Ben spoke about before this is just dealing with one issue, which is measurement, right? There are at least four or five other big issues, all of which have different proposals that could very easily make that group, but they have not yet. Uh, there are definitely some signs, and we've uh, written about this publicly as well. Uh, I believe the title of our blog post is called um, 
uh, that competition should not be used to hobble privacy protections on the open web. And like I think that sentence summarizes broadly what we think is happening here, that um, by choosing to keep third party cookies until the new technologies are ready, um, what regulators are doing is forcing people like both Google, but also other individuals to choose between competition and privacy and to make it a binary, that you have to have one or you can have the other, when in fact in reality they are much um, like they actually complement each other, and there is a way to for regulators to cooperate much more, which uh, the Information Commissioner's Office is doing in the UK. But I think in general, it's something that we should do more of. You know, if I if I can just yeah. add something on this in terms of the the dynamics that are coming in, the DMA is really interesting because it is um, a regulation that that introduces a list of obligations, and the the gatekeepers is very large tech companies. They are uh, actually expected obliged to proactively comply to these obligations on the basis of which you know, they would explain, uh, they would demonstrate how they, they comply, and that then the, the European Commission will look into these, these reports and may decide to, to look uh, more closely what we call specification of the, some of the obligations. Um, and so it's interesting to see that you know, the gatekeepers are going to have to initiate this effort. And um, as we've heard several times from the Commission, uh, and that's a very good thing, you know. They've been uh, they've been saying that the gatekeepers would be expected also to um, to engage with third parties, with you know their their competitors, with uh, other um, actors in the in the ecosystem, to ensure that their compliance is um, you know effective and balanced. Okay, and it's also an interesting one to to watch out, which then I think shows very well how the legal requirements also go way beyond and see how the the whole ecosystem should should um, yeah, redefine the way they, they work together. Um, I look around again. Um, we are getting closer to lunch, so um, are there more questions? I obviously have a few more, but uh, I want to give the chance to everyone to intervene and ask your questions or share your comments and thoughts. Yes, one more here, yeah. So DSA bans advertising that's targeted based on my like so sensitive information like ethnicity or race or sexual orientation. What about things like I go to YouTube and YouTube is trying to engage me for as long as possible by recommending videos and the videos are targeted based on those sensitive information. But once the videos start playing, they show the pre-roll ads and the ads aren't. So the ads do comply, but the platform is trying to reel me in to see as much ads as possible by using sensitive information. Is this compliant or not? <laughs> yeah, sure. And I mean, the actual reason why we're willing to answer that is like uh, at Mozilla, we actually did research on exactly that. The project is called YouTube Regrets. So please do look it up. But it's essentially uh, a couple of hundred thousand people installed, installed an extension in their browser. And what that extension did was when you went to YouTube, it looked at your recommendation history. So when you started seeing a video, whichever video automatically played next and whichever video automatically played next, it just kept a record of how that was evolving. And users had the ability that if, when this recommendation came, they didn't like it, to just click on a button and say they regret that recommendation. That it's a recommendation they didn't want because it was either polarizing, not related to what they wanted. Um, we've come out with two reports on this. We've recently released the data set that collects uh, that information for research as well, and we want to release a much larger one. But uh, for us, in Recommender Systems, the YouTube Regrets project was an attempt to actually first gather evidence for, for exactly, I think, the question that you demonstrated. And there, um, it became pretty clear to us that even YouTube doesn't really know why it is recommending a video that uh, is, it is showing to you. Like, if you were to ask YouTube, like, give us 10 reasons why you think you are showing this video and not the other one. Uh, in our understanding, the kind of systems they use, like, they may not be able to necessarily give you a definitive you know, like descending order list of these are the criteria by which these videos were recommended. They are videos it thinks that you will find engaging on the basis of videos that other people have seen after they saw your video and a bunch of other factors. Um, but the lack of transparency in that is actually the biggest thing that like was a realization for us. And for a lot of the work that we did in the Digital Services Act, not just on advertising, but on algorithmic transparency and its work that we're doing in the AI Act as well, is actually to 
provide more data to researchers to be able to answer, I think, the question that you've just said, which is why is it happening first? And once you understand why it's happening, there are certain outcomes that you can regulate. Um, and uh, for example, in the United States and Facebook, when it comes to uh, advertising, they showed ads that discriminated to, uh, against people uh, on the basis of their race for houses, right? Facebook's defense in court for seven years was that's not why we showed those ads. There were other reasons, but the outcome was discriminatory. And then eventually they stopped showing those ads, right? Like So many times that can happen as well, which is you do it with one intent, but the outcome, independent of what you want to do, may be discriminatory uh, as well. So there's a, I think we need a lot more evidence and research before being able to really answer some of those questions. A bit of a related question, actually, um, is contextual advertising based on these sensitive attributes actually still allowed? Because I can imagine that if the system recommends you something based on sensitive properties, and then it shows you advertisement that's contextually related to that, that content, it's still kind of a segue to basically targeted advertising. It's about profiling of people, so looking at people's behavior. Um, so I guess then the question is define contextual advertising, but if it's gathering profile about someone's viewing behavior, viewing at certain content, uh, I think that would be captured as well by that ban. Um, so it's, yeah, it's not just tracking someone, it's profiling someone uh, and using sensitive information in that profile. Yeah, I mean, we, I, like in our internal assessment, contextual advertising is also targeted advertising. You're just targeting it on a different set of criteria, but here it, like, it's the page that you're on, but that doesn't mean it's not targeted. Uh, though it's definitely not clear whether regulators will enforce it that way. Okay, um, I think this uh, timer keeps on flashing and making like red signs, so I'm getting a bit nervous. Um, I think we covered a lot of very interesting uh, topics. Um, I want to uh, thank my panelists for, for joining me and sharing their expertise. Um, I think all of you are still here a little bit longer, so if you have other questions or ideas or concerns, feel free to uh, approach us. I certainly had a, a great time discussing those things with all of you. Um, I think we proved my speaker coach wrong, and this was quite an, an interactive and a good session uh, before lunch. And with that, I think lunch is where we are heading next.